Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, the QCC wrap-up special. I'm Sean, and here with me live and direct, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. I expect it'll be a quiet night in the chat room tonight as we're recording this out of our usual schedule, but welcome to anyone who's popping by. Actually, we have more people than we often have on a Thursday night, so we are off on that, and that's yeah. awesome. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where normally we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, but tonight, it's all about what we all played last weekend at QCC. So, this past weekend, September, don't even know, 9 till 11th, whatever. Thursday, fr Friday, Saturday, Sunday, this past weekend, was a convention, a gaming convention in Buffalo, New York, called Queen City Conquest, or QCC for short. Uh, this is a local smaller con uh, that we attended due to some past history with some of the organizers and the guests that will be there. Uh, there are a group of people, they call themselves the Gem Group. So the Gnome Stew people, the Encoded Designs people, and the Misdirected Mark people. And if those were Venn diagrams, they're pretty close to a circle. There's some bumps here and there. Uh, there's also Lake Effect Gaming in there. That is in a fantastic group of folk I met originally at Breakout Con in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, just this past summer, hooked up with again in... Uh, I don't even know what month it was, but at Origins in Cleveland, Ohio, and just couldn't wait to hang out with these folk again. So took the drive up and around to Buffalo and checked out their local con at their request. It was a very neat show. Uh, we were not there as special guests or anything. Uh, there was a Kickstarter that you could back to get tickets. I backed that as a VIG, very important gamer. Uh, mainly did that to support the people I uh, I enjoy hanging out with. Uh, Sean joined us, as did my wife. My wife was also there as a VIG. Sean came as a normal person. Things went really well. We hope to be back next year, though next year I think we're going as media tabletop bellhop for the win. So <laughs> save a bit of money there. So uh, you guys got there a little earlier than I did on Thursday night and uh, got to enjoy a little uh, dinner with the gem folks. That is correct. So we drove up from Windsor, Ontario, uh, fairly norm. I don't know, my, uneventful drive until we got to the border. Now, you would think that'd be a bad part that it was eventful, but I was in shock when we pulled up to that bridge. First off, I didn't have to stop and pay anyone to go over it, which is just weird because there's a whole Maddie Maroon thing going on down here in Windsor and it's big news all the time. Uh, not having to pay to cross the bridge was cool. And then we got to the other side and it was like beautiful. It was a nice day. There were flowers everywhere and bees buzzing around and there weren't any like sirens or searchlights or people with assault rifles or flak jackets. Because while well, I live in Windsor and going to Detroit is kind of like that. This was not. It was really cool. It was very welcoming, and like we passed through in moments. Like it was like, here you go, have our passport. They're like, where are you from? We're like Canada. It's like, where are you going? We're like, going to a convention at the the Buffalo Convention Center. Okay, here you go. I'm like, I sat there for a minute looking at the guy because I've never seen that before. For people not very aware, weird. crossing into Detroit is a challenge. There are two crossings from Windsor to Detroit: the tunnel and the bridge, and neither one of them is pleasant. I. When Detroit is becoming a much nicer place. The, 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 the core of Detroit has become a, a lively and, and vibrant area. But the border crossings, for whatever reason, are still very tumultuous passages. Like, <laughs> I just assumed it was like that going anywhere in the U.S., especially in modern times. So I, don't, I didn't think it was a Detroit thing. I just thought it was an American thing. I've, ends up it's a Detroit thing. I, I've I've had the uh, opportunity to cross at a lot of different border crossings between America and Canada, and uh, no, it's it's Windsor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you get used to it so, when you live there. Yeah, yeah. Like we used to go over every weekend, so we don't go over as much anymore. But yeah, and that was that was interesting. So and Uncle Luke had to was the Peace Bridge, and yes, that's where that's where we crossed. Peace Bridge is a beautiful. Yes, crossing. yes, it was the Peace Bridge. But holy cow, nice comparatively, like shockingly. 
So it was a pleasant start. Like I actually felt welcomed in the U.S. for a change, which is odd. Uh, finding the convention center was ridiculously easy. Like it was literally take the first exit and drive down one street, and you were at uh, well, actually at the hotel, not the convention center. Convention center was right across the street. Hotel was nice enough. We were at the Hyatt Regency Buffalo, something like that. Hyatt Regency, big hotel, nice lobby. I don't know, not a lot to say about that. Uh, we got in fairly early, but not early enough to really do much. So we just kind of hung out in the room. We went down to the lobby, ran into some people right away. Victor Wyatt, um, not part of the gem group, but part of the, the fan club. I don't know. Part, part of the group, but not a podcaster, blogger, or any of that. Just someone who's part of that crowd. Ran into him, talked to him for a bit, and um, talked about going for a bit of a walk, maybe doing some photography. And we ended up just heading down to the place where this party was going to be. And we decided to have dinner upstairs. So Victor joined us. We went and had a really nice dinner. Food was decent. Uh, beer was fairly good. And then we went downstairs to the big party. Uh, the party was phenomenal. Like it was the most relaxed, big social party I've ever been in where, how did Phil word it? Phil worded it well. It was like going to a wedding where you actually like your family. Like it was just like, you know, everyone and you know who everyone is and everyone's just hanging out with each other, having a good time. It was a wonderful space in a basement of this place. Very welcoming, huge long bar. They only had one bartender for us, but uh, he was enough. He was able to keep up. And I did the social butterfly thing. So I had to explain this to people at QCC. Here I am on a live show, so people probably don't believe it. And when I'm at cons, I'm pretty gregarious. I'm pretty loud and out there. That's not me normally. Like, that that takes a, a moment of concentration. i got to make a will save. I don't know, however you want to word it. If you had seen me at Origins in 2015, all I did was sit at the big bar on two and drink Yingling. And I couldn't get up the nerves to talk to anyone. Uh, thankfully that's changing over the years. So this was cool for me because I did the social butterfly thing. Like, yeah, at first Deanna and I kind of sat together and yeah, when we came in, I gave Phil a hug and we kind of talked a bit, but like by the end of the night, I'm like, I'm going to go sit with this group for a while and talk to them. And then I'm going to go sit with these guys. And then I'm going to come over here and sit with these guys and I'm going to chill with these people. And that was awesome. That part was really cool. Uh, and everyone there was awesome. Like, there were some people I met for the first time, but most of it was reunions with people I had met originally at Breakout, again at Origins, and it was like like old friends, just like when Sean comes down from Toronto or Hamilton now. He just like, this is awesome. We hang out and talk as if like no time went by, which is I always find with the best friends. That's kind of how it's like. doesn't matter how much time's gone by. When you hook back up, it's as if you never left. So beer was good. They, they brought out some food. I had buffalo wings i did eat a buffalo i think two buffalo wings while i was there i'm sure anyone from the area would say those were horrible buffalo wings but they were pretty good like I, z and i were, were talking about it and her theory is they brine them before cooking them and that might be the buffalo secret but we're not sure that might be the the galati cheese of buffalo i i don't know if that's actually true but, the, but for wings they're better than anything i've had here so so thumbs up on the wings buffalo Anything so that, else on Thursday? I forget anything. No, I think that was your that was your Thursday night. Uh, you had you enjoyed a couple of nice beers. How were you feeling on uh, on Friday morning when you got up? See, this over? was the good thing about Friday morning. The con didn't open till noon, so I was good by noon. I was good. Now, if I had to get up at eight and play a game at nine, that that might not have gone so good. But being able to sleep in really helped. Uh, I don't. I probably overdid it a bit, but not too badly. <laughs> I'll put it that way. There was one conversation I kind of put my foot in my mouth, but uh, I think overall it went well. Excellent. And uh, round about noon, I finally finished the conference call. I'd been on for work all morning and uh, rolled in. Had a, a, my own pleasant experience at the border that I'm a little more <laughs> used to, but it was still, uh, still nice and easy. And uh, we met up in the Starbucks at the hotel and... Uh, I, I, it was so nice in the morning, I even got to check into my hotel room early. So they, they gave me my room at yep. like at noon. So that was a positive start to the day. And we crossed over and uh, started saying hi to folks and uh, checking in. Yep. I got to say, the Starbucks breakfast was the best breakfast we found the whole time we were there. Well, we, not we are not gonna, a, we're not going to yeah. recommend the uh, Hyatt breakfast to anyone. Yeah. 
Exactly. I, I'll admit we didn't venture forth and try to find good breakfast, but don't eat at the Hyatt. Like, oh, that's all I'll say. It it was not good or worth it. I I heard. I think it was. I think it was. I think it was a Sunday that I ended up hearing about someone someone talking about a really nice breakfast place across the way, but it was already Sunday. So <laughs> I did notice. Meeps and Peeps noted uh, we they don't call them buffalo wings in Buffalo. They just call them wings. There we go. Makes sense. So I'm still going to call Windsor Pizza Windsor Pizza because no one believes it exists. So we, we don't get we're not high enough level to just say pizza and people imply. Well, New York pizza. New York Pizza is called New York Pizza in New York too. So, so there you go. Uh, yeah. So you had a game booked right off the start at one o'clock on Friday. Yes, I did. So. A bit before that, getting over to the convention center was easy to get to. The only thing that was kind of silly is the uh, hotels on the back of the convention center. There's no way in from the back, so you kind of have to walk around, but whatever. Uh, inside was nice. It was a little hard to find the con when you first walked in, even though it was the only thing going on. Like, there were no, hey, go this way. But then you just kind of heard sounds off to the left, which I realized in the video, I think I'm pointing right, but it's my left at this point. And you head over there, and we immediately started running into people we knew. Uh, registration was ridiculously simple, like especially if you're used to any other larger con. But like even compared to Breakout, at Breakout, I did have to wait in line a bit. No, this was walk right up. Chris was there, gave Chris the, my name. I do not remember her name. Jen, I think was her name managed to find our badges and everything, get us our t-shirt and all that stuff. So that was pretty cool. Um, Check-in was no problem. Got my got my swag for being a VIG. Uh, then I took advantage of something pretty awesome. That The biggest advantage of having that VIG badge, I think, was the fact there was a little private room just down the hallway for all the, the guests. And being able to store my stuff in there was fantastic. Otherwise, I would have had a pint glass and a t-shirt I would have to carry around all day. Plus, when I went shopping later, I ended up buying some games. So that was a huge bonus. Yeah, definitely uh, worth the uh, rolling, rolling suitcase like Phil was talking about. It's it's yeah. almost a must at a game like that. Even even knowing you've got be. the the vi the vig room, having a having a small rolling suitcase can can be a lifesaver at events like that. Yeah, it's a, it's I don't know how little a known fact is a potentially little known fact about Phil Vecchione is he is the bag master. If you ever want to know like what kind of bag to buy, they, he's the one to talk to. So first game of the day for me was Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Not how I would expect to start off a con. Also, what most people wouldn't know is I've never actually played Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I played lots of D&D, but not 5th. Uh, this was with the fantastic Andy Fox. Uh, of C She's a super geek, a actual play podcast featuring women as GMs. Andy was running a D&D game in her personal setting our personal game world called Levanti. Uh, if any of you subscribe to the Wednesday evening podcast, All Stars, that's another actual play podcast where they are playing in Andy's world right now. So we played in that world. Um, great game, great table. Andy runs a very high magic, very low seriousness, very, very gonzo game. It, it was rather over the top and rather epic. It was quite a bit of fun. I played a halfling barbarian. Uh, part of the adventure had me dressing up in a sexy uh, paladin costume, and I got to learn about consent because we don't lay on hands without asking permission. That gives a good idea of the tone for the entire game. All righty. <laughs> yeah. I'll admit, I don't think it really showcased Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, except for the fact that it really showed that you can kind of do anything in D&D. It's not all about bashing goblins and orcs. There we go. So, so while I was playing D&D, what were you up to? So we got up to some board gaming. They had a remarkably large and unexpectedly large selection of board games available to play. But on top of that, they had a play and win section of their board games, where you could open up a, open up a new box, punch it all yourself, lay it out, learn to play, play the game, and when you put it back, you would sign off on a sheet. And then on Sunday afternoon, they uh, did a draw out of uh, for each game out of all the people who had played it, and gave away all those games. That is very cool. So that was fantastic. Now I know I know my wife was really looking forward to the board gaming, and when she had seen the 
the pre-registration when she went on tabletop events the the website for registering there really was not a lot of board games listed like no. very little and most of what was there was uh social deduction party games big group games now it was different once you got there once we got there it was different and there were some other things that were a little odd about the board games for instance they were having tournament a tournament or a several several sort of tournament games uh for yeah. prizes and trophies but they were Odd choices for tournaments. Um, the, the yeah, peng- I think I remember the seeing, penguin. Uh, the penguin game. Um, yeah, ice cool. <laughs> ice cool is not not what I would have considered as a, as a tournament game. But um, and then they didn't get much play. To be honest, I didn't. No. I think I saw one table being used on Saturday, and that was it. Yeah, um, I was at the, the board game area. Didn't look very popular at all, especially on Friday. The, the mornings, the board game areas were very popular. Before, a lot of people okay. were getting into games. Uh, every time, every day when I sat down in the mornings, uh, there'd be at least eight or eight or ten people sitting around playing board games, you know, warming up, having a having a coffee, and uh, and then at lunchtime there was usually a game or two getting played while people were uh, enjoying uh, whatever food they had scrounged up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the first game we played was. Role play, and this is one we you'd been talking about wanting me to get me into play for some time. Yeah. Role and player, role player, and it was role great. Player. It was great. Um, it's in many ways a sort of a version of Azul with dice, even. Um, so you know, it's 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 a pattern. It's a pattern matching. You're laying down, uh, laying down your dice in patterns, and it's fun. Uh, you were playing. You were playing a uh, a halfling in a sexy costume, and I ended up playing a psychopathic uh, halfling chosen one. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so I have to say, I I recommend role play wholeheartedly. Uh, Anchi Games and I had a, had a couple of great games of that. We played it once and got you know to get me used to it, and then played another mm-hmm. uh, another game full through once I uh, was familiar with the rules. That's always a good sign. When you finish a game, you're like, okay, let's play again. Yeah, That's no. always an awesome sign. Absolutely, and I'd sit down that uh, anytime. Uh, and yeah, so I guess uh, Mage, Mage Kayla is saying only two of the tournaments actually ran. So. Wow, only two. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Uh, we talked a bit about that in the after show uh, at Misdirect and Mark and a bit like a you know what? I'm skipping ahead. We'll get to that. <laughs> that, w- that was Sunday night. We'll get to yeah. Sunday night. So the next thing we did is we got up and we wandered around a little bit. We couldn't decide what we wanted, what else we wanted to play at the board game table. So uh, Angie Games and I took a little sort of wander around to see what was there, all the different tables. Mm-hmm. And we ran into that's... a play test um, of a new game that's uh, coming out. He's, he's planning on Kickstartering next year called Merchants of Lore. Um, yeah, I never got to try that. I, they, I kept playing near him. Like I swear, I was at a table around him. Well, he was—he had a fantastic location. To be honest, I mean, he was right next to the encoded designs and in, in misdirected mark board game uh, board yep. t- dedicated tables. So he had a great location. Um, the game was interesting. Um, it was a um, uh, getting you know buy and deliver uh, sort yeah, of game. Pick up and deliver. Pick up and, pick up and deliver. Um, he had some graphical. Uh, problems with the layout. There was some, there was some confusion on his design of the board game uh, that we talked to him about, and um, you had to lay out the the city cards in a specific way, or you couldn't really tell what city was what on the board. He didn't actually right. indicate them. Uh, and then there was a uh, it was a, a a pirate and sort of shipping concept between the uh, great cities of the world, um, and it was interesting actually. He'd put in a um, uh, a, a an African uh, sort of ancient city that I'd never I hadn't been aware of. So it was it was interesting okay. that he, he actually did a, a really nice coverage. It was Camelot and uh, the mine, you know, the great mine cities and, and Atlantis and the, the standards uh, Egypt. Uh, but then he uh, in, he put in this African city that I wasn't aware of. Instead of instead of Egypt, he put in this African oh, ancient cool. city that was that was quite interesting. Um, and then there was a mechanic where he had a risk card. That you got between when you were traveling between cities, there was a time and risk whenever you moved between two cities, um, and the faster the route, the more risk. Except okay. his numbers didn't quite work. Now, some people might not know, Anshi Games is incredibly lucky with dice. <laughs> um, I'm I'm generally happy to just if we have to roll to see who goes first, 
I'll just give it to Angie Games because <laughs> she's going to win that role. Um, and he was com- the, the 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 game designer was completely boggled as she rolled over and over again and never got risk ever. Uh, <laughs> she never got a risk card. Uh, and I only and I only got off. two. And I only got two all the way through. So we we talked to him about uh, changing his math a little bit and increasing the risk because it was really way too hard to get any risk. Okay. Um, and then after that, we sat down with Tom, who was playing uh, playing some games at his table, and uh, I learned I got to play Circle of Six with him. Bob. Bob. Sorry. Uh, yes. Bob Everson. Yeah. Bob, not Tom. Tom was a different one. Bob. Bob was playing. Uh, all of his games at the table. Yeah. So uh, we lots said, of people. Sorry if we screw up names. <laughs> I've never met Sean most of these people before. Yeah, so. Sean in particular had never met any of these people. I, so I, I missed the uh, I missed the fi- the uh, the Thursday night where I would have been introduced and more been more familiar with all of them. Uh, but Circle of Six is his own little card game where it's uh, basically a sort of cutthroat. You're just laying cards down and trying to fill up a full set of six. Uh, and it was fun. We played at least. Two or four hands of that until nice. you were wrapped up your D and D game. See, I um, tried Circle of Six at Origins. I was pretty impressed by it. Just a note: walking around, I was uh, impressed by the number of vendors and the quality of the vendors. Actually, more impressed by the quality of the numbers. So, uh, quality over quantity, I guess. The the there was the most amazing. I'm going to say booth, but it wasn't a booth. But the the most amazing indie RPG booth. Now everyone knew, there knew the guy's name. I didn't know it. Sorry, I don't know if he's from IPR or where he comes from. I'm sure someone in, ch- in the chat can tell us. Um, this guy had, like, it was like every good indie game that's ever been published there in print. Like, he had ash cans. He had stuff. Tales from the Loop gets, like, printed in Sweden and imported over here, and he had five copies. Like, th- this this was an amazing booth. Like, I, last time when I was at Origins, I had two friends ask me to pick up copies of Worldwide Wrestling because they can't find it here. Well, he had a pile of them there. Like, it, I was really impressed by that booth. Added to that, there was someone doing custom dice trays. There was costuming for cosplay. There was 3D scenery. Uh, your usual t-shirts, buttons, pins. Like, there was a lot of awesome stuff for sale at that con. And I liked that it wasn't in a dealer's hall. Like, it was just kind of around the edges, the periphery of everything else. And it wasn't in the way, and it didn't get loud. So it, it seemed to work really well. I, I was very impressed by that. That was nice. While you were playing games, uh, you know, if there was some downtime, you could be looking around, you could be seeing other things up there. As soon as your games were finished, it was just natural. It was a good flow to walk around the uh, the outside on your way to whatever you were doing next and, and see what was there. Um, uh, the one thing I was sort of disappointed about was the the video game section. I The way it had been described yeah. early on was I was expecting a significant number of video games there available to be played and, you know, a a sort of downtime area, much like the board game area, but with, with video games. And I don't really know why it was there. Um, I guess people were playing. Well, yeah, but they only had six, they only had six, six different consoles with, I I don't know what limit of games. Most of them were older consoles with older games. It was really only the Xbox that was always in use the entire time. Um, because I mean, who doesn't want to play with an Xbox? Um, <laughs> but that's an odd, uh, that, that was an odd one. I wasn't, uh, expecting that. Uh, there were people using it. I don't know. I don't know if more games and better games would have had more people playing or not. Yeah. So I see in the chat, it was Jim likes games is the company. All right. Jim know. likes games. All right. Fair yeah. enough. I'm going to have to look them up. Like guy was nice too. Like he was chatting me up for a while. Um, he was really cool with, uh, I bought something and then wanted to buy something else and then something else. And he's like, yeah, just run it through again. I, the only, the only problem I had is he wasn't willing to give me a paper receipt, which is a problem going over the border, but I, he had no way to give me anything. So yep. that's, that's not really his fault. And I don't think there were that many, well, there was a, at least a handful of Canadians there, including us, but yeah. not a lot of people from like overseas or anything there. Uh, and so the other thing we played uh, that uh, and she games and I played was Artemis. And that's an yeah. interesting one. Now, I don't I think... I told you it was good. Yeah, you did. And I don't think we had the best Artemis experience, based on what <laughs> I've heard from, from, from other cons. 
But Artemis is a fantastic game where you sit down at a, your own computer uh, and there's a network of up to seven computers hooked together that are all playing a starship. Uh, and, and so each computer is a different department uh, or, or commander in a starship. And so you've got engineering, communications, your pilot, um, science, your captain, uh, and you all have to work together to solve various levels of missions and various abilities and uh, things going on uh, in order to win. Uh, and it is a fantastic idea. It's a Star Trek simulator, right? Yeah. It's there. There's Basically. no branding here. There are no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's very, Star it's Trek. very much a, a Star Trek simulator. Um, and it's, it's fun. Uh, I was a little disappointed. The uh, gentleman running the game didn't really show up until after lunch and just kind of wandered around a little bit. Um, and so I don't think there was as much interest in the game as well. They didn't set it up so you could sign up for sessions. There was one sign up session at four o'clock on Friday and that was it. Um, so I don't know whether that was the fault of the Artemis people who didn't sign up for the, uh, the con properly or the con people for not understanding how the game was, but that was disappointing. But throughout the day, uh, because there weren't a lot of people interested, it was also over the weekend. Uh, I sat down, probably got six different uh, rounds in on that. So that was fun, and I'm looking forward to that at another con. I see our chat room's growing. Hey, Teldern, I saw Sean Gilgore jump in. He's one of the men behind the con, so I'm sure he's taking notes. Uh, <laughs> thanks all for joining. Uh, feel free to chat amongst yourselves. We are watching the chat. If you have any questions or if we get something wrong, please correct us. Uh, it was a long weekend. Like I said, Sean met a lot of people for the first time. I met a lot of people again, so we may get names wrong. We do apologize. Yep. Uh, so then after yep. Artemis, we actually played something together. This is the first role-playing game that you and I have sat down at a table as players. Um, Possibly ever. I think there might have been one other time way back in yesteryear, but for all intents and purposes, the first time we yes. actually sat down as pretty, players. Pretty close. Did you ever play a Cremo with Don? If you played a Cremo, we did. We yes, played we both, yes yeah, we've okay. played Cats before. So yes, that we, would have been the we, other we time. Played, we played anthropomorph anthropomorphic cyberpunk Cats before. Yeah, an orange football who had to use the last yurtle in the row. Yes. <laughs> um. uh, so, yes, we played in one of, in my opinion, coolest new city, settings coming out uh, of the RPG industry right now. That is Hydro Hacker Operatives, otherwise known as H2O by Phil Vecchion of Encoded Designs, Misdirected Mark, Gnome Stew, and probably 13 other things. Uh, this is a... Let's see if I can remember the pitch. I'm probably not going to get it perfect, but it's hydropunk Robin Hoods stealing water from the corporation to help your neighborhood survive. Yep. That is pretty close to the pitch. It is very cool. Phil is probably the biggest cyberpunk fan I've met. Like, I'm into it. I like it. Sean likes it. Phil, like, lives it. He's pretty hardcore about it. And this was Phil wanting to write a cyberpunk game, trying to do something empowered by the apocalypse, and actually coming up with something new. So instead of hacking computers, you are literally plumbing pipes. And there is a plumber, there's a diviner, you do a hydro hack where you're stealing water. Like, And his setting, actually amazingly, goes back to Akrima City because those big hulking guards remind me of Blue Suit so much. But he has this water authority who controls all of the water left on Earth. There's no potable water left. They import blue water from space. That's what the rich people drink, and those of us down below drink the green water and use red water to, like, cool our machines and everything. It is such a great setting. And, of course, Phil was the one running it, and you can just see his passion. Like, even when he's showing off the... the his props, right? Well, they weren't really props, but like, here's what the water authority looks like. And, oh, and here's one of these. And there's some really neat stuff in there. Like the, one of my favorite mechanics in that is the sweat mechanic, because it's all about water. Your sweat is important. And when you do certain moves, you have to sweat to do them. And then a lot of the consequences, the hard and soft moves the DM can do when you roll like crap is make you sweat more. And then when you work with other players, 
there's a really cool relationship system. And part of that is if you work with people you're not cool with, you both sweat more. And of course, part of the game is keeping you hydrated. Like it, I was really impressed. Now, what do you think of it, Sean? You know what? I had a great time. Uh, Phil is absolutely a passionate, uh, a passionate DM who knows and loves his system. It's not just a system he wrote because he wanted to come up with a game. Um, he very obviously spent a lot of time and energy, personal energy, on this system uh, because he loves it. And, and that came through. Um, this was also my first uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game. Um, yeah, I know you were a little... I'm not uh, 100% on the power... I'm going to fly in my room. Um, I'm not a 100% fan of the Powered by the Apocalypse system. Um, it's interesting. It was new. It, again, it was my first time, so I, I'm not going to write it off yet. Um, and I understand Phil runs it a little more sort of close to the rule set than, and, than some DMs might be, and that's fine. Um, but I had a great time. It was uh, a great setting. The, the pre-gen concepts to get us going were fantastic. And we, actually, and we actually played a different concept for him. The re, this, this, was a, this wasn't actually a hydro hack. Um, this was Phil using the system to prove that the game could actually do something other than hacking. Uh, mm -hmm. So to put it to people who are familiar with Cyberpunk, rather than uh, a, a hack system where you go in and you spend, and a lot of time is spent on that hacker hacking the corporations... Um, it's, uh, I think everyone got to have a little more fun and a lot more time because there wasn't that, that narrow focus on the hack and, uh, and a lot of, you know, all the players got, um, uh, got to do something and got to play their aspects quite well. Yeah, it was a solid game. It was his first time trying to, uh, run a mystery. So right. we, we had a mystery to solve in our H2O game. So just to add to what Sean's saying, I have played mm -hmm. Hydro Hackers before. I played it at... Breakout con? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tried to play at Origins, but unfortunately not enough people showed up. Someone showed up and said, is is this the uh, the plumbing game? And wouldn't play once he said, yes, it was. Uh, that's the problem with a brand new game, right? Brand new game and non-famous designer. I think a lot of people know Phil, but that's in a smaller community. So Phil's starting to get better known, but when people don't know your name and don't know your game, it's hard to get players. Whereas Breakout, small, tight, kind of like... Uh, QCC, so it's a lot easier to get the word out and get people. So the hydro hack is actually a completely separate set of mechanics, and he has made a separate game for hydro hacking. So when I played, we played, it was called um, Broken Main, and what our scenario was was someone stealing our water. Like, okay, I guess that's kind of your scenario too. Big chunks of water gone not little transactions tried to figure out who done it no this was we knew who was doing it and we had to get the water back so it was it was much more uh, in your face action there were drone combats and setting people up and driving and a very different game from what we played now the hydro hack i've never gotten to play but i know phil has done a lot of work to make it so it's not the cyberpunk problem where just the one player plays now, no one gets to see that until he launches the Kickstarter in 2019. So we'll hear a lot more about that in the coming years, assuming I don't fall out of love with Hydro Hackers. I'm sure we'll be talking about it again. And so that was how we wrapped up our our day one of the con, or our, our first official day of the con. You um, missed one important thing, though. Huh? That dinner, and more importantly, that pork bun. Well, I was, I was, I was, I was going to separate con and dinner, but yes, we found a okay. fantastic ramen place. Wow. Yeah. I did my research. I, I, I run a food blog. If people don't follow, I, I haven't updated it since I started the bellhop thing because one's my job now and the other is something I did as a hobby, but I, I used to run a food blog. I am a foodie. Uh, I do my research before going to a new town. So part of that research was to find out that Soba ramen, so, Sato, Sato ramen is the best ramen in the city. Okay, part one. Part two, there is a place within walking distance of the hotel called Sato Brew Pub. Then doing the research to find out that, yes, Sato Brew Pub sells the ramen from Sato Ramen. So we went there, and it was good. It now, was. it doesn't beat Solon's Ramen at Eros here in Windsor that we went to for the, the, the launch party. That I don't think you can beat that. <laughs> if anyone can, it'll be Solon will top himself at some point. 
but I had this appetizer that was just like a folded pork bun. Oh my god, that was like one of the best things I've eaten ever. Like we were talked about going back the next night, and I would just order three of those. Yeah, and I actually and I had ramen, which was again great ramen, but no, not you didn't so get ramen. Room. You got the rice. Or sorry, I got the tan, I got the tan tan. Yeah, yeah, you got the tan tan rice, and then I got the fries, which were phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, it was a it was a really sort of rich um, combination of flavors that was that could have been easily overpowering, but it just worked out well. Um, it was a it was a spicy mayonnaise with um, just a Kimchi bunch of or something on top. Yeah, and it was yeah. it just tasted fantastic. Yeah, that uh, was good. And so that was the that was the end to the end to the aftercon day on uh, on Friday. Yeah, uh, we did meet up with all the gem people and a bunch of people at the con back at the Hyatt. Had a few more drinks, hung out pretty late into the night, which was pretty <laughs> awesome too. There were yep. some good experiences there. Um, if anyone knows Angela Murray, Ange, follow her on Facebook. She has some fantastic pictures of that after party. We'll call it. Then uh, we slept in. <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. Uh, fairly early day the next day. I had a game at 10 o'clock, so right. not getting up at noon. And I admit I barely made it to 10 o'clock. <laughs> That's why I ate the buffet was I got downstairs at like 930 and I'm like, hey, buffet, I can order. I can get my food. I don't have to wait for it to come and I can eat a lot because this is one of the things I would not call this a problem with the con. But one of the things that was a little difficult to schedule was the timing of the games, you only had an hour between each game. And an hour is enough time to go get fast food, but there wasn't a lot of fast food in the area. So it was a little bit difficult to fit meals in. And then the last game of the night wasn't ending until 10 p.m. And a lot of the restaurants in the area closed at like 8, 9. There wasn't a lot open. So it was a little bit difficult. Now I noticed a lot of people were using um, whatever. I don't know what they're called there. Eat Your City, we call it here. That I don't know. You call it use an app and order food and they deliver it to you, whatever they call that there. Um, other people had found a couple local places to find food, and I did notice people managing to fit in meals in those one hour breaks, but I didn't want to try to do that. So none of us ate, like the three of us didn't eat until like 10 30, 11 at night every night. So I was getting hungry. So that was the other reason I went for the buffet. I'm like, I'm eating more today so that I'm not starving in the middle of my last game of the night. So this is, again, I can't really put that on the con. That's not their fault. It just, there wasn't quick edible food nearby. Like I saw there was a subway, but I don't need a subway in Canada. I'm not going to a subway in the States. We're, yeah, we're somewhat food stop, food stop. Skip the dishes. There we go. That's it. Skip Thank the you. dishes. Thank, Thank you, Major Kayla. I, I knew if I saw it, I would be like, I heard it multiple times because everyone kept telling me, just skip the dishes. I, I now, again, generally... VIG room, VIG room bonus. They did have snacks in there, which was awesome. Like, that was great. There was, like, not even just junk food. Like, well, pretzels, I guess, are kind of junk food. But there was, like, apples and bananas and Twizzlers for some reason. There were Twizzlers every time. There was a coffee machine. So that, that was a bit of a lifesaver because there was a couple times I stopped in there and grabbed some pretzels and a coffee. And I just don't generally eat much during the day, so I had my latte or two in the morning, and that was enough to to get me through till dinner. But that's just me. I don't recommend that as a general as a general health rule for anyone. Uh, right. So uh, Saturday morning, you sat down at Rockers and Vending Machines. Close. Close. It's again with Phil with Phil Vecchio, and I played Rocker Boys and Vending Machines. Rocker Boys. That's it. Yeah, Rocker Boys and Vending Machines. That's straight out of Cyberpunk 2020. There's an amusing story behind that name that has to do with when Misdirected Mark was first getting popular. There's another, they call him the Brother Podcast, uh, Gaming and BS, which the BS isn't for the BS you'd think, though sometimes it is. Uh, it's Brett and Sean. And they had a little thing going back and forth about bards and whether they're cool or not. And both shows eventually agreed that the only cool bard was the Cyberpunk 2013 2020 Rocker Boy. So that's where that part comes from. And the vending machine one's a longer story. This is Phil's love letter to Cyberpunk. And as I said, Phil is like the Cyberpunk guy. So what he did is there's a game out there, one page RPG called Lasers and Feelings. And it's a one-page RPG where you play one episode of Star Trek. And the neat mechanic is everything you do, you're either good at lasers or feelings. It's like a sliding scale, right, from two to five. And you're trying to roll 
over like if you're trying to do say it's lasers to feelings i may have it backwards if you have a two when you're trying to use feelings you're trying to roll over when you're trying to use lasers you roll under and then everything you do is either lasers or feelings which fits star trek really well right it's either tech or it's emotion and that's pretty much the whole show and you're able to recreate an episode really well well phil took it and made cyberpunk for this so he upped it to two pages because he put a whole dm side where you can generate the adventure as well as the front side where you generate your characters. And it's um, rock and machine are your two stats. So it's you're rated two to five in rock and machine. I played a rocker boy named White Lion through the biggest concert ever. Uh, Phil rolled up the job, not at the table, but ahead of time where we were doing an extraction of a rock star. Uh, if you want to hear more about that game, listen to the latest episode of Misdirected Mark whenever it goes live. The one they recorded last night. Phil was pretty proud of this game. He talked a lot about it. This was a fun game. Like, it's. I think Sean really should have joined us because all the, the fiddly bits and mechanics of Powered by the Apocalypse were thrown out, and this was just pure cyberpunk. Now, it was humorous, gonzo cyberpunk with things like my character had experimental olfactory receptors, or sorry, projectors as part of his concert. And we had a guy, um, Speedboy Quick was his name. He was a courier who had cyber legs, but before he could use them, he had to watch a 30 second ad. So it, it, it was over the top and it was hilarious. Um, it's only a two hour slot and I get why, because it's so intense. Like everyone's just in doing cyberpunk, do it, do it, do it. And by the end, you're a little tired, right? Like you're, you're bringing, you're bringing the Chrome. You're, you're running this game hot and heavy and throw in every uh, trope you can think of. It was a fantastic game. Like I, I had a great time with that game, even cooler. Well, not even cooler than the great game. The great game was great. What was nice is it's a free game. So Phil just let us keep our copies of the rules and brought them home. So really, I got a copy of the game, which you can get on drive through or anywhere else. Really impressed by it. Phil did a great job on that game and, of course, ran it fantastically. Uh, so while you were playing that, Angie Games and I went back to the table to see what we could play and maybe try and play to win. Uh, and the first game we played that I actually we actually did win. Uh, which was The Networks. Now, this is a game where... It's a card-based game where you're playing a TV studio who has... is in the, in the, in the gutter. you got no viewers. No one's watching your shows. And you need to bring in new shows with new stars and new advertisers to generate viewers. And the game is all about viewers. Uh, advertisers gain money. Money can be spent to gain other things in the game. But the, the actual goal of the game is to get viewers um okay and there is uh, a number of mechanics it's an interesting uh, it's a card based game and then they've got everything laid out nicely on three on a three card scoring board um and it's but it's really nice because while it is modified for two player the way uh and games and i played it it's really easily modified you just literally flip the board the scoring boards over and the two game is the and everything you need to know about the two game the two player game is right there. It's just a couple of different cards here and there, and there's a different mechanic for turns. Um, okay. Because cards are burned after a full rotation of turns, uh, and it's a little um, you need to burn more cards when you've got less players. So that was the one thing that was a little a little odd. Um, we had to sort of stop and think about how that. Um, how that get, how that part went, but once we figured out the the way that the turn rotation went and when to burn a card, um, mm -hmm. it was really easy to get through. Uh, the biggest problem we had with that one was we tried to let someone else teach us who yeah. hadn't played the game in a while, and oh, that it, happens. It was tough. Um, so, but he had to uh, move on and, and try to help somebody else. So we grabbed the manual. And I learn well from manuals, so uh, you know we we jumped in and and we picked it up pretty quickly, uh, and uh, again we played I, that one twice as well. I remember when you met up with me, you were like, "I found this guy that's got to watch our episode on uh, on teaching games." Badly. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> and, and his, you know, he uh, he didn't he said up front that he hadn't played it in a long time, so yeah. we knew uh, we knew going in. Uh, that was something I didn't play a lot of board games. We'll get to one I did play in a minute, but one of the things I found odd or lacking in a way was that there was no one to teach that huge game library. So there were all those games there, 
but you had to know the games to play them or you had to sit to read them. It'd be really nice to have someone there. Now, I realize that means you have to have someone local who has the time, inclination, and skill to do so, but it would have been cooler to have at least someone there. And add to that someone who was organizing things, orchestrating, like someone who was like, oh, you're looking for a game? Are you also looking for a game? I think the kind of stuff I do at game nights every time we have a WGR event, right? That just seemed to be lacking. It would have been cool to see because like the first night I remember going there and being like, it says play to win, but those are sealed. Those obviously aren't play to win, right? And yeah. it wasn't until Saturday that you even figured it out. Yeah, and there was there was there a sign-up sheet, but we didn't ever find the sign-up sheet until we saw someone else using it at a later point. Uh, yeah. It, it was, there was someone in charge of the area, but we didn't figure that out until like Saturday afternoon. Uh, yeah, because even the, even though we were, even though we'd met him and talked to him and he'd come over and talk to us, we had no idea that was his job. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I just thought he was, cause he was also running one of the stores, yes. right? So he had customers. Yeah. He had like, one I of guess the stores, that. but he was also in charge of, of the things. And there was just, it, it wasn't clear. Um, and right. that was unfortunate. And I don't know if that was unfortunate for on his part or on the, on the cons part, but it, it, it just, there were some, there was some lack of clarity with the board gaming. And, and now that I've heard a little more, I understand that again, they aren't expecting a lot in the Buffalo area. The board gamers don't seem to, yeah. to come out to stuff. But even even a sign over his booth where yep. he was vending thing, if you want to play the games, talk to me or something yep. like yep. the board game, come here, just, some more look uh, more visibility plus communication like i mentioned there wasn't a lot in the event planning saying this was going on i didn't even know there was going to be play to win until we got there so yeah it could have been communicated better now again i'm sounding overly negative here and i don't mean it that way like it was still cool it just Absolutely. there's room for improvement yeah we enjoyed ourselves and it's just all a matter of uh, of learning and trying things differently next year and seeing if uh, we can have an even better experience for everybody uh, so you guys finished networks, yeah. and if I remember, I wandered in about then, and yeah. I think you already had drop it out on the table. Or I think I think that was my chance to go get my second latte of the day, and, and while you guys set up. Oh, that's right. <laughs> no, I walked in and I saw Deanna, and she games, and I, and my wife, and I asked her if they played it yet, and they hadn't. So we brought it over to the table, and then we did what always happens the first time I play a game. We played drop it extreme. Because <laughs> every first game of everything I ever play has to be the extreme version. So when you play Drop It, you drop shapes in a thing. And there's rules there, but not as many as we thought. So you can't have the same shapes touching or the same colors. And then there's things around the edges, the border of this. It, I don't know. It looks like a Connect 4 board something. I don't know what else to compare it to. Uh but we thought the way the edges worked, there were these zones marked off that the edges applied to the whole zone. And after dropping probably about seven pieces, we we're like, it was I over. can't drop a yeah. single piece. Like <laughs> anything I drop, we can't do. So then I double checked the rules and I'm like, oh, the edges only touching the edges. Yeah. Then we played twice, three times, at least twice. I think, well, I think we've played three times, including the uh, three, extreme. Yeah. <laughs> I was really impressed. Now, when we were at Origins, the game was there. But, like, you see this thing? It looks like a toy. Like It really yeah. does. It looks like something like Connect 4. It looks like a Hasbro find it on the end of an aisle at uh, Toys R Us for 10 bucks kind of game. And I walked right past it, like, multiple times at Origins. And then listening to podcasts after the fact and catching up on podcasts, I swear every podcast I listened to was like, oh, did you try Drop It? Oh, my God, Drop It was the surprise hit. Oh, at Origins? You went to Origins? Did you play Drop It? And I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> like, it didn't look like much. So when I saw that in the library, that was the one game. I'm like, sometime this weekend, I'm playing that. And it was worth it. Like, it's for a dexterity game. The one guy who walked over, who might have been the guy in charge of the area, I don't know. Someone had walked over during our game. And he said, yeah, it's neat. It's like Connect 4 for geeks. And I don't disagree. It yep. was kind of what it was. And she games brought up the pieces and, and this, this was what got me. Um, it looks like when you look at the box, they're going to be cheap plastic molded stamped pieces. Yeah. And it wasn't, it was wood pieces and it was a very, it was a light wood. So on top of everything else, they didn't behave the way you expected when you looked at the box, they didn't have <laughs> the weight 
They didn't have the weight you expected, so there was a little bit of bounce when they dropped. Uh, I know that first time through, I it was. Yeah, I was gonna say, they, they didn't, they didn't act drop. how you expected ever. No. So. but they, you know, you just the the you get a little bit of a different bounce and, and different drop compared to uh, a molded plastic stamp yeah. compared to uh, that natural, you know, painted wood. Uh, and it was enjoyable and made it uh, it made it that much more challenging. But yeah, no, I wasn't uh, I wasn't skilled at that game. It was fun. No, it was skilled. fun. It was good. I want a copy to bring out to events, right? Like I run local events here in Windsor, and I like any game that gets people's attention. Yeah. Even better if they're good too, right? And this yeah. hits both parts. It's that this awesome. would be the perfect game for that uh, for that purpose. Yeah. And so, so from there, yeah. we did go see Tom, and we played in Tom's Tales from the Loop game. Absolutely. And this was a this was a a, a blast. Uh, the yeah. setting is interesting. It's it's blatantly, I think, a ripoff of ET and Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. You're playing kids with bikes, and we yeah, did. they're not we played, trying to hide it. Yeah, we played kids with bikes. Now the the overarching theme, which uh, amusingly we didn't actually know until yeah, three quarters yes. of the way through the game, the loop. They, they call it Tales from the Loop, and the loop is actually a giant. Super Collider built underneath the city, which is causing strangeness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you've yeah, got a, interesting. you've got a world where giant mechs and, and dinosaurs and things sort of exist around you due to an interaction between the the Super Collider messing with reality. Um, and so al- you get aliens and interdimensional beings and 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 things happening. Uh, and we didn't know that, but it was okay because it didn't matter. You were playing yeah. '80s kids on bikes and. It was fun to really play up the tropes and the the you know the eighties movie themes, uh, and it was uh, it was great. Yeah, it was good. I I did have to laugh at that because while we were playing partway through, I don't remember when Tom put it in, but he put in a direct reference to the loop, and I'm like, Tom, I'm sorry, you got to stop. What's the loop? And he's like, oh, like we've been playing for two and a half hours oh, at that point. Like, absolutely. Like we've been in and having a great time. We were and... we were actually approaching the sort of you know the ramp up to that final yeah. that final game. We it was we had well, just I think, gotten the I think MacGuffin. The loop, I think the loop was supposed to be like a reveal, like a dun dun dun, and we're like the what? <laughs> yeah, we we had so, we had just basically gotten the MacGuffin and we're we're about to approach the the approach the end game using it. And it was, uh, we look at the loop. Oh, well, the loop, it's showing you, but, but yeah, what, what is it? What, what's it showing? <laughs> yeah, we, we had some goggles. Um, um, one, one of the best parts of that game, too, was I finally got to play a game with Kevin Lovecraft. He, he was phenomenal. Like, I've heard him on actual play podcasts many times. There's a reason they put him on actual play podcasts. Like, I really enjoyed gaming with him. Me and him really played off each other. Unfortunately, we though we did have another player who I have never seen a player at a con so checked out from a game. Like he literally in the middle of the game was reading the Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 Dungeon Master's Guide. And now this is no fault of Tom's. Tom did more than I thought after the game. He told me he actually took this guy aside and said, hey, if you're not having fun, you can leave. What can I do to involve your character? What can I it like Tom did everything he could to get this guy into the game. And he just I don't know. He was he was there. Yes. Yeah. About all I could say. Yeah. He the weirdest part is he seemed to come up with a cool character. Yeah. Like when we were doing character generation and when he was planning out his character and whenever backstory came up, he was right in it. But then when it came time for stuff to happen in the game and for him to do it, he just, he was checked out. Yeah. So I, I, I felt bad for Tom in that. Like, thankfully he had three people who were really dialed in and I, I, we had a great game and this guy seemed said he had a good game, I guess. I, that's, that's the thing playing at cons, right? You get yeah. all types. I was amused when, uh, when, when I, when I jumped in and I, I pulled out an 80s trope near the end of the game and <laughs> you know we're kids on bikes I think that was again that's the that's the theme and we were being approached by a police officer driving up to the you know place we weren't supposed to be in and so we all ran and hid and after as we did I said well you know what we're a bunch of kids we dumped our bikes in in, in plain sight and ran away um so and and all of a sudden jumped in and he's like well 
but but maybe we hit it in the tall grass. I'm like, no, no, this is an 80s movie. We dumped our yeah. bikes directly in front of where this police officer is going to shine his light, his flashlight. There is mm-hmm. no there is no way around that. This is this is an 80s movie. Um, yeah. It was just funny to see how someone pushed back on something like that. Um, well, you know, it, especially it, it, in a con game when we're trying to you know really dive into the 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 whole the whole theme. I think I think he had the the. Must win. I don't want to bash D and D players here, but the D and D mentality, the the I want to win. I, yep. I failing is not inter- failing is failing, as opposed to failing is making the story interesting, which is such a huge push in modern role playing. Just one last note on Tales from the Loop. Never played it before. Um, knew very little about the background. Like I knew, I didn't know what the loop was. I knew about the kids on bike thing. Very. Um, I, I like the system. Like I wasn't, I don't usually like dice pools, especially dice pools where only a six matters, but I really like the whole multiple success. Like the fact we had to have a sheet of paper to look them up wasn't the best, but I liked the way that system worked. It, yep. it's it rewarded good roles. And I don't know. I liked it. Even, even little things like the, our age determine how many points we have. Yeah. So yeah. at the same time, my wife was also playing tales from the loop at the exact same time. And when her game finished, she came over, had also had a good time. She's like, you got to buy this game. So that the fact that I spent $50 US on a game when I'm not buying any new games is a good indicator of how much I we both enjoyed Tales from the Loop. And, and to be even more amazing, this was actually the first con game Angie Games had ever played with strangers. Oh, that's true. Uh, and she loved it and made you buy the game. So that's, yep. you know, that's that's a pretty high bar to... To set, I mean, we um, really should have got her on mics tonight somehow. She'll be on for the after show. There we you go. You can talk to her during the after show. Right now, she's doing her techie background um, moderator stuff. It's not yeah. like I try to keep her off the show. <laughs> you can't let her talk though, or else she would have dropped three f bombs by now. There we go. We we are a, we are a G rated show until the after show. Uh, <laughs> yes. So after that was the dinner break. Uh, and then I was supposed to have a episode, a game of Black Sat, but uh, we are a, a Cthulhu in space adventure. <laughs> but but unfortunately, in space. Uh, the poor DM was suffering from the fact that they had too many DMs at this con, which is a great thing. I mean, it really is. As a except yeah. he too many volunteers is, yeah, he, is not uh, something you usually hear. He uh, he actually had to cancel all of his games that day because he didn't have enough players. So I was a little disappointed there. Um, oh, and that was also the interaction. That was where they had the auction, which sort of ruffled everyone's I, feathers. I think at this point, everyone is going to complain about the auction. I think all the uh, Buffalo people have heard it. The people organizing the con have heard it. it. From what I hear, it was better than last year. But yeah, that wasn't great. It, I think it went. It went. It, it went over, and and it, it, it interfered with someone's game. Some of these games' time, and I get, I get that. But yeah, it I, it didn't bother me. I think we could have, you know, yeah. you could have done character generation during that easily. Um, not not only like I run auctions every year for extra life, and I'm amazed they got it done in the time they did. They they so, moved through a lot of a lot of property there. But anyway, a lot of people are upset about that. I'm sure they'll do a better job next year. Yeah. Uh, and so you jumped into something else. Uh, One Child's Heart. Yes. That was uh, the most interesting RPG experience I've ever had. Camden Wright is the writer for that game. I think it's coming to Kickstarter next year. I It is a unique experience. You are playing child care professionals. All the players are playing child care professionals who use a machine that he never mentioned it this way, but it reminded me a lot of Assassin's Creed where you get strapped into a machine and you play through the child's memories. The thing is you are playing through the child's most traumatic memories because this is a problem child. It's a very problem child who, if you don't interfere, their life is going to spiral. You are going in there as healthcare professionals talking to the kid and you don't change time. Like you're not looking to change anything, but it's kind of like the voices in their head and they're going to remember talking to you. So you're trying to provide guidance and then you play through a set number of memories. And then depending on how you did, you do an interlude. And then at the end, you find out how this child ended up. 
Camden is amazing as a DM. Like, talk about getting into character. But this is Camden playing in kid. Like, it was the most intense experience I've had in anything that I've ever called a game. I will not say I had a good time because I did not. Was it a worthwhile experience? That I'm not even sure. It was emotional, touching, and I don't know. It effed me up, right? Like, that's, I don't know. That's not what I normally want from a game. And it's it's I, tough calling that a game. It's an experience. Yeah. Well, it's a game because there was like there were game mechanics. There were dice. There was chance of failure. Like it was a traditional RPG that way. Like we had stats and we rolled on our stats to do things. But like, man, tugging on the heartstrings and like after effects and like they talk about bleed. No, there's there's bleed in this game. Like it D D terms, I was bloodied. Right. It it's messed up. I really like I've told lots of people over the years, not every game's for every person. Like this game is gonna be for a small group of people will dig this. Right. And they'll probably love it. And I've met people who love this game. Uh I know what you're getting into. Like I knew what I was getting into, and even then I was surprised, and the other people I played with felt the same. Uh Wear Gator, Eric Boons, I think is his last name said, you know, like, he plays, he, he's all about the games with the feels, and he's like, no, nah, even I was blindsided by that. So, yeah, it was it was something else. It was memorable. It's going to stick with me. It's M Major it's, Kayla mentions she could never play it in public, and that's sort of what it seems like to me. It, it seems like an odd choice for a con game. It seems like a, a powerful gaming I, experience, but as a con game, I don't know. You know what? I mentioned that because Camden ends an hour early on purpose to have a cool-down period, and I think that's strongly required. And I think the con being there was a benefit, at least for me, because whenever it felt too intense, I could kind of look around and go, oh, yeah, I'm at a con. Right. Whereas if I was in a little small private room, I think it would have hit even harder and that would have been bad. Well, and it helps that we got to go out for good food afterwards, which we'll get to. After. Uh, yes. Uh, but while you were while you were. Um... Experiencing, being traumatized, being traumatized <laughs> and decompressing at that. Uh, yeah, Angie Games and I were back at the board game table again uh, because I had a uh, my, my game failed to start. Uh, I hadn't been expecting to get any more board games in, but uh, we managed to get in uh, Istanbul, uh, which is another one we brought home, uh, yep. and it was fun, absolutely enjoyable. Uh, and then uh, Karuba. It was the was the other one we played, and it was good you know what it was it was interesting. Um, it was a perfect knowledge game. Uh, there's no uh, one player randomly draws tiles for placement, uh, and you're trying to get uh, all your adventurers to a bunch of temples through a jungle, and it's a, you're laying path you're laying down paths. Uh, there are gems in the way, um, and it's you got a certain whoever gets to the whoever finishes a path or. To the temple first, gets a certain number of points, and so on, you know, every way down, and then you pick up extra victory points for what gems you get. Uh, again, it's perfect knowledge. Everyone has all the pieces laid out in front of them, except for the one player who's drawing the cards, and they're the one who's determining the random order. Uh, so in a perfect world, you, you should be able to know your path. Uh, the only thing, the only real variable, other than the order the tiles come out, is uh, every player gets to determine where one meeple and one uh, temple goes around the side of the board. So the the path you need to take randomizes every game, and then the order in which the pieces come out randomizes in every game. Okay. But the actual, you know, again, you know what all of the pieces are at any time. You can look and see what pieces are still available, what pieces are still out there. Mm -hmm. Um. We uh, we extremed it the first time through because we hadn't we hadn't understood the 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 placement. It's uh, it's not designed for uh, the rules weren't designed for how two people lay out the pieces very well. Um, it would have been more obvious if we had more people. So when we went when we read through the second time, we went, oh wait a second, no no no, hold on, we just we just need to do it that way. Um, it was fun. I it's I would aim it for younger players. Uh, for me, I felt like if I'd gone through it a couple more times, uh, the perfect knowledge aspect would have meant, oh, I could look at the board and go, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to need this piece here, this piece here, this piece here. 
and as long as they come up in a reasonable order, you know, mm -hmm. um, you're you'll get there. Um, right. There's not too many. You know, best the best path is going to be available to you. It's just a matter of when. Um, but for younger kids who aren't able to sort of do that advanced planning and and, and picture that structure, I think they would love it. Um, cool. Really fun that way. Uh, and then your game wrapped up, and we went to Azul, but not the yes, game for did. a change. But <laughs> we we should have brought it. We talked we about it. We should have. We should. Well, this goes back to the me doing my research to find good food. Um, one of the places I found within walking distance was a place called Casa Azul, which was a Mexican place. And I am a big fan of Mexican food, and we wanted to try it. Plus, the original plan was to bring our copy of Azul and play it there. For those of you who don't listen to the show regularly, uh, Deanna and I play a lot of Azul. Whenever we do a week in review, it's like we play this, then Azul, this, then Azul. We play a lot of Azul. So we thought it'd be funny, but then... Sean started Googling the place and it looked like they just had bar seating and we're like, eh, I don't know if we want to bring it. So we didn't bring the game. We should have, although I probably would have spilled it all over the street because I had a bit of a slip and fall on the way to Casa as well. Between that and Camden's game, I vaguely remember that dinner. The food was okay. <laughs> That's, I, I was still messed in my head and I messed up my legs. So it was, uh, I remember it being good. It was not as good as the ramen place. Yeah. I think if we, had a larger sampling of food. There was some good and there was some so-so. Uh, my biggest fault was the fact that they didn't serve it on plates. And they served it on wooden yes. boards. And when you ate a juicy taco, all your other tacos on the board got saturated and disintegrated because they just absorbed. It wasn't absorbed. a board. It was like a two by four. Yeah. Like it was tall. It was, yeah. Like I know there's a website out there and there's like food served on stupid crap. I, it, this place needs to be on there. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually had forgotten about that till you mentioned it. But yeah, I got one of the. I got the carne asada in particular yep. was very wet. It was, and yep. it like was pouring off the thing onto my lap, like like plates. Come on, people, they have edges. But I have to say, really the carne asada was probably the best of the tacos that, we had. Yes, um, I agree. The carne asada was the best. Yep. I also got chicken that was okay, and then I got rice and beans, which was a total mistake. The rice and beans were very bland. I, I was uh, disappointed there, with the fish. It was, it was, I, it sounded fantastic and it should have been, but the ratio of flavoring to fish was off. You had too much yeah. fish. So, but overall good. Like, I think you need to know the, the right. Yeah. I, I would right like to order. I would go back and try, try different items on the menu to give it a better, a better review. So to be honest, next time we go, I'd probably pick somewhere else. I'd go back to the ramen Back to place. pork buns. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd definitely go back to the ramen place. That Azul, maybe if I couldn't find anything else open. Actually, that is one good thing. It didn't matter for us, but like we were talking about how the con ended late, right? So most of the time you weren't eating till like 10, 11. Uh, Casa Azul was open till 2 a.m. So that, if you want late night food, they seem like the place to go. Yep. Uh... So then back to the hotel and a bit of an after party, but not too much. Oh, no, that was the pizza log night. Oh, right. That yeah, was pizza logs. That was pizza logs. <laughs> that was pizza logs. Yes. So we had just got back. So anyone who was at the con, I'm sure the chat room will even talk about pizza logs. There was this meme that started that night. So we show up and Chris got smart. He's one of the organizers. Chris Nizak was one of the organizers for the con. And instead of us like grabbing tables, mishmashed, he actually asked the hotel if we could have like a section of the restaurant for like the after party, we'll call it the, the end of the night. And that was cool because he gave us this nice little area down kind of out of the way. It was well lit, which was awesome for people playing games, which was only just us. us but yeah, <laughs> just us. That that was a common theme. Um, and this menu came out and there was an extensive conversation about are there any good foods that are logs? And that was rather amusing. And I learned that the the Yule log, or not Yule, the Christmas log, yep. is a Canadian thing. I had no idea that was a Canadian thing, and the Americans didn't know what that was. Not that I brought that up. The, I'm forgetting their names. Rob and Kate from Toronto mentioned that. And I'm like, oh, really? Didn't know that was, was not local. And then everyone else there got pizza logs. Like, like, I think there was about 30 orders of pizza logs ordered that night. It, that was the thing. Yep. I did not try them because I was stuffed from tacos. Yeah. I almost so, did. I was tempted, but <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll admit I was too. We probably should have split some. So this was this was another this is not a complaint on the con organizers. 
maybe it's the con format, but every other game con I've gone to, when you get together these things after the party, you play games still. Like the gaming doesn't stop. Like I actually thought it was go back to the Hyatt for late night gaming. And while our table, me, Sean, and Deanna were the only people playing games, and I felt awkward doing it, so we kind of stopped. So we played a game of Azul, which, as we were just saying, we couldn't play it at the restaurant, so we had to play it when we got back to the hotel. Uh, then I tried to teach Sean Race for the Galaxy, which unfortunately didn't go very well. I'm For some reason, I have a complete yeah, inability just... to, to grok that game. I don't understand why. Maybe it's a, maybe it was a late night thing. Maybe I was. That's what I'm thinking. I, it's not... Maybe I, I, for some reason I I've now I've played it twice now. I played it once on uh, on Board Game Arena and and once yeah. now live. And I I'm missing something and I don't know what. So yeah, I don't know what it is. Like I, I'll admit it was totally me being um, self serving. I wanted Sean to learn <laughs> so I'd have someone new to play on Board Game Arena. So. That didn't quite work out. And then, like I said, I felt kind of awkward being the only people playing games. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that it's an RPG con. And most of the people who are there have played three games. And I know, like, the most I've ever run is two games in a night whenever I do our Extra Life events. By the end of the second game, I'm done. Like, I, I, I have no interest in gaming anything. Give me a beer, sit, chat, great. Maybe go to bed. But gaming more, no. And I think that's a lot of it. Plus, a lot of the people who were coming to the show were the the guests and the people who were running the games more so than the players. I just think people were tired and wanted to hang out and relax. And I get it. But I was personally disappointed. I'm like, I thought like I was going to play 80 games of Azul over the weekend, so in everyone. Like even Chris Nizak's like, oh, we got to play Azul this weekend. Every time I saw him, he's like, no, I'm tired, man. Play Azul. Yeah, I think even if if I had if I if my Black Sat game had happened uh, and I had gotten two full RPGs in, I I might have even passed on on Azul. Um, yeah. But again, we we just played board games for that after after session, so that was that. Uh, but it was a good night. Um, yeah, I think everyone had a really good night on Saturday. That was that was sort of the yeah. Every, everyone was in a great mood. Everyone was yeah. And then uh, everyone went to bed, and you were feeling a little rough, so you had a late morning. Uh, yes, I got up early, so I went and checked out the uh, the play and win table on my own uh and played a couple of card games uh champions of earth um which was a simple uh simple mechanic it's literally just a, a turnover and, and and matching numbers to beat the undead and aliens and things that are invading um i don't know why it's a single it has a single player version uh the whole concept of the game is cooperating and bidding with your the other players at the yeah. table to gain advantage to win um, it's a pretty dumb single player game, but I, it was, it had a single player option. So I tried it and I sat and played a couple hey. of games of it. It gave me something Fair to do enough. while I was sitting, drink, sitting and drinking coffee. Um, and everyone was having a sort of a slow Sunday morning. So that was fun. I, I will have to say it wasn't from drinking too much. If no, anything, no. that would have been probably, no, it's cause I, I said I busted that was the my bail. pretty bad. Yeah. That was, that, the that was the, uh, not used to streetcars in Canada. I don't know. I don't know what to blame it on. Well, they're in Canada. They're not in Windsor. You were, you were looking at your phone as you walked. Uh, yeah, there was that too. I was trying to find Casa as well. Yeah. But yeah, I actually didn't have that much strength that night. That was all the previous nights. Yep. Uh, I was... Uh, what was after that? Then, oh, then, then we, we sat down and while we were waiting for our yes, actual game, you. we finally laid out Laser Riders. Now, we've talked about that in the, in a previous episode, so we don't need to go into it. But it is a fun Tron-like board game. Um, I wanted Sean to try it. It was yeah. one of the things that wanted to get to the table before he went home. Yeah. So again, for people who don't watch the show regularly, Sean and I have known each other since grade one. Well, I was in grade one. He was in kindergarten. And Sean betrayed us and moved away. So he doesn't game with us all that often anymore. So until we can convince him to come down to Windsor, we usually don't get to game. So that was one I really wanted to show him. And, and I... I still can't believe the game's good. Like it just, it looks so gimmicky and over the top with the holograms and reflective and the silly die. It just, I, but it's fun. It's, it's a good game. 80s graphic design barfed all over a really good game. Uh, yeah. Now I have to say for three players, the six foot rounds were a little on the large well, yeah. side. That it, was, it was not yeah. the right table to be playing that game on. Yeah. That is true. So, um then after that we went to our last game of the con and honestly i loved this game and more than more than the game i mean uh tracy tracy tracy, yes. tracy barnett tracy barnett was the designer of the game 
and it was run right. Uh, it was run based off the Fate Accelerated system, yeah. and we had been. It had been a running theme between just between ourselves talking about games where you know mechanics getting in the way. I, I don't enjoy. I, I don't enjoy overly yeah. mechanical RPGs. And now, for anyone listening who's in indie games, he found Powered by the Apocalypse got in the way. So. <laughs> Well, not saying a lot. It's but not also, like we tried to play Traveler yeah. and Champions. No, no, but also, but I mean, we did, we did acknowledge that Phil tends to run it a little more on the mechanical side for Powered by the Apocalypse. But well, I think that's his, yeah, yeah, and that's just that's just a style, and that's fine. Again, I enjoyed yeah. them, but I had been talking about this sort of ideal game that I didn't really think existed, and then we played Power, and then we played the Fate Accelerated, and I realized, oh no, it exists. This is that game. Yeah. Um. This for, is, you know, this is the game that that takes a lot of the mechanics out, or at least the, the storytelling is the mechanic. Mm-hmm. So for anyone listening, it's Iron Edda Accelerated was the game. Sean hadn't mentioned the name. It's based on the Fate Accelerated system, but it's Iron Edda Accelerated, which just kickstarted like two weeks ago. The game's coming. It's coming in PDF and I think hard and soft cover. Uh, it was originally based on Fate Core, and there was Iron Edda. This is the accelerated version, which Tracy has really streamlined. It was it was fantastic. One of the most interesting uh, character development and 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 just sort of way of playing a game. His background is fantastic. It's a Norse mythology based uh, after the apocalypse. The dwarves have have risen with giant mechs. It's it's Norse uh, Pacific Rim. Yeah, basically. So you've got. Yeah, he uh, said I've never played Skyrim, but he said it was Pacific Rim meets Skyrim. Yeah. I'm assuming Skyrim must have lots of Norse influence. So yeah, basically you've got dwarves in giant mechs versus the Norse in uh, bone armor. So giant, yes. they're they're wearing they're wearing the bones of giants in uh, an epic size, and it's yes, and and epic. Uh, Anchi Games mentions it sounds so epic. Well, that's the whole theme. That was it. That was it's, the point. There's there's actually a scale in the game, and epic is one of those scale levels. And so yeah, you, you had actually heroic. God, epic, then godlike. I think were the three. Yeah, and it's yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. Whereas you're you're really trying to make an epic idea. Uh, so you're trying to make an epic movie essentially, and and everything everything is playing towards the goal of making this whole you know what is going to be an epic game. Um, yeah. And and the fate accelerated system just works really well for that. Uh, and then the way Tracy played it, I think, was really well. Uh, we had a we had a sort of one player in that game who was a little on the I don't know troubleish <laughs> side. Uh, Tracy had to sort of yeah. stop him a couple of times, but I, I think the the way watching Tracy do that way in itself was was he, he handled, handled it, the table. He handled it beautifully. Um, yeah, he knows how to handle a table. It was fantastic. Um, Sorry, they. I apologize. They, they know how to handle it, uh, and uh, it just it worked out. Uh, it worked out wonderfully. Yeah, I was impressed. Now I've, I had Sean's problem with Race for the Galaxy. I had with Fate. I have bought. I bought. Uh, I received a copy of Base Raiders, which is a superhero dungeon crawl game set using Fate. Uh, I also own. There's another one, Dresden Files. I picked up Dresden Files, the original one from Evil Hat Games, and I, I couldn't get it. Like I read it multiple times, I couldn't get it. So sitting down at this table, it was great to have an expert in the system to be able to ask questions. And there was some concepts that just did not click in for me. Uh, just the way the narration engages the mechanics, and more importantly, that the mechanics don't matter until they do which I realize sounds very ephemeral, but that's part of why I didn't get it was because reading it just didn't click. Uh, Tracy was able to set me straight. I don't know if that's the right term, but put me on the right path. Uh, Not that I was doing anything wrong, but I got it. He was able to explain it in a way that fate finally makes sense. Now I'm kind of looking forward to tearing through those games in my basement and trying out fate. But yeah, it was a good game. Uh, It didn't quite run as smooth as it could have, but it was still great. And yep. none of that was Tracy's fault. Tracy managed that table very well, actually. I think out of all the DMs we played with, he had the uh, the most 
problems that he dealt with well. Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm assuming Phil could probably do the same. He just didn't have any players that were problems, so we didn't get to see it. I don't know. Yeah. I feel like I'm digging a hole here. I don't know. I, <laughs> no, you know what? Yeah. There were there were, there were players. It was it was the last game of the con. He was burnt. Actually. We had uh, a lot. Of, you know, we had players who were getting into something because they had they thought the concept was really cool, but I don't think they really understood the system they were getting into and the kind of game it was. They saw Ragnarok and they were looking for they, a D&D they thought, game. D- they wanted to bash. They wanted they, they, they wanted, wanted a D&D bash game. And yeah. and and I don't even though I don't think the system was really. Uh, the game, or you know, I don't think Tracy's concept is re- is really as much in that direction. He turned it, and we were there. You know, we gave these D- these guys the D and D system. We gave everyone else, you know, some back and forth and some mm-hmm. some interaction, and we had an epic adventure, um, and it was fun. Yeah, so it was good. Actually, that's a it's a good comment about the entire con, at least everything I saw. So. Out of all the games I played, and I played in five RPGs, six, should have been six. I can't remember how many, it should have been six. Two on Friday, three and one, no, five. Okay, whatever. Played in more RPGs than I usually play in. Every table had four to six players and a DM. So we're I'm interacting with like six people at a time, right? So like 30 people I played games with. Out of that, there was one dude who wanted to read the book instead of play. And there was this other... Um, you know, the over-eager girlfriend meme was kind of that in role-playing form. It, that was it. Like, everyone else was awesome. Like, like not just good role-player, like, awesome. Like, the guys that wanted to play D&D were still good. Like, the like they, I'm, again, I feel like I'm bashing D&D. I have nothing against D&D and D&D players. It's a certain style of play. I'm even a fan of it, but it's not what we really saw at that con. Uh, it's not how I, I mean it. But, like, uh, there's a... There's a there's a certain mentality of uh, bash the monsters, grab their loot, and there were players who were very much there for that. Even they were getting into character, playing well, rolling with the punches, and role-playing up the fullest. We met some fantastic people that I'd never met before, and I gamed with some old friends. It was awesome. Like The, the yep. people really made that con. Absolutely. Uh, and while we were playing... Ironetta accelerated, and she games got into Phil's other new game. Yeah. Um, uh, something about uh, the Queen. Long live the Queen. Long live. The... Long live the Queen. Long live the Queen. Yep. Uh, uh, maybe she'll talk about that in the after show. Sure. As far as I know, she had a fantastic time. I hear. Excuse me. She pl- role played extremely well based on all the feedback I've seen. Her character was very memorable. I heard about her playing both sides of a couple stories that uh, made some impressions, which was cool. All in all, while there were some surprises and the, there were some some scheduling and I think pre pre scheduling pre registration issues, uh, and there, again, you know, some surprises are like with board games and things when we showed up. It was a fantastic con, and yeah, I would be happy good. to go back next year. Um, really enjoyed so myself. So after that. Unfortunately, Sean missed this. So we sat around talking for a long time because Sean had to leave. And as I mentioned, I don't see him that often. Yeah. So we enjoy hanging out. So we talked, stood on the I street guess, for about breath. half an hour or something. Yeah, at least. Basically. And it was cold too. And I was holding my box, I had my milk crate full of games. Uh, but anyway, we hung out for a bit. And then Sean left. And what he missed that was actually really cool was the gem people organized an impromptu uh, closing party. It wasn't on the books, it wasn't planned, but it came up, and they brought us to uh, Big Ditch Brewery. And, Sean, if you remember, we were walking to Casa Azul. We, and we I was saw the... Badly. I went, that says brewery. We should just go there. It's closer. That well, was that the was place. Big Ditch Brewery. Right. And Big Ditch Brewery beat the ramen place. Like, it, it... Okay, it wasn't as good as the pork bun, but the ramen place overall, if you include the beer, the atmosphere, Big Ditch was amazing. We showed up with 26 people unannounced and they managed it perfectly. They set up tall tables. They set up side tables. They got everyone's drinks. They didn't mess anything up. And oh my God, the food was good. Like almost everyone there got burgers and what they're known for there are their ketchups and sauces and 
everyone was doing the spend an extra buck to get two sauces for your burgers. I got a meatloaf that was fantastic, so as good as Jack's out in Kingsville. Uh, they had flights of beer, and that was the best craft beer I had in Buffalo. I don't know if it's Buffalo's best craft beer, but it was better than any of the other places we went. I did really like the ramen place for beer. This was much different style. They actually had a couple sours on tap. And then that was a great finish to it because it was all those gem people. It was all the people, some of the people we had just met mixed with the people I've now known for two years and love interacting with, having a last meal together before saying goodbye. So next year, I don't care if you got to work, you got to stay for that last after party because you missed something special there. That was good. So much hugging. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, no. Next and then year, we had the next year. It'll try next year. I'm definitely going to try and do the bookend, and uh, I get the Thursday and the Sunday night sort yeah. of uh, in there. That was uh, yeah, it was like, a great. But now was, that I and now that I know the guys, I'll feel more comfortable. Uh, for those who yeah. don't know me, I tend to be a a, a significant introvert. Uh, a little less so than than Anchi Games. I I do play a con game. I will play a con game more often. But uh, no, I'm I'm generally you know. Well, I mean, look at this one. I signed up for most of the games next to you because yep. you know. That that, that and comfort level. Play separate games, but yeah, but yeah. I mean, overall, I I gotta say it, it was a great con. Like yes, there were some issues, but yeah. like nothing major. Now I know a lot of people are saying it's their favorite con, especially the gem people. I get it, it's their local con. I'm still a little partial. The breakout breakout was really nice. I, part of it being just it's in Canada and it's downtown Toronto. Well, the I board game the board game difference is a big thing. Like well, uh, that, I think breakout that, breakout handled board games in a significantly better way. Whereas there were a lot of surprises that sort of popped up, and Buffalo is not a board gaming town. We no. get that now. We, well, we learned that. Um, yes. And so our expectations will be a little different next year going in. Yeah. Uh, the other the other issue, which I hadn't brought up yet, because we didn't go to any, because we didn't know when they were, were the panels. So this is my one actual complaint. Like, this, this is silly. No one knew there were panels. And then when they showed up in the PDF guidebook, we're like, oh, there's panels. And they were at the back of the book after all the Sunday events. So we all just assumed they were Sunday. It was bad enough that D was playing in Ange's Tales from the Loop game. And Ange didn't know she had a panel. So, like, even the people in them didn't yeah. know. She knew she had a panel. Oh, sorry. She knew she had a panel. She didn't realize it was the same time as her game. Yeah. So if Deanna didn't know that, there were a bunch of players sitting at that table who had no clue their DM was at a panel. And D had to tell them, she's like, look, I'm pretty sure Ange is at a panel. So that that is definitely something to improve on. Uh, I didn't know those panels were there. That, and I found it odd for the number of guests. And oh my God, yes. Like they had the who's who of the indie RPG scene. Like there were some big names there. Like we already mentioned Tracy. There was Aloy Santa. I'm not even going to mention them because I'll forget someone and I'll feel bad. Ryan Macklin. Uh, see, I can't help it. But there, there were a bunch of like in your industry, like, if you're into indie gaming, this was a, this was kind of the cream of the crop. They weren't on panels. Like that seemed odd to me. Like if you're gonna have all those people, I remember Chris Helton talking to him, going, "Oh, are you doing any panels this weekend?" He's like, "No, I'm just here at the con with Contessa." I'm like, "Oh, it's cool." It just seems like to me you'd use use that clout, use those people. Plus, I want to hear from these people. Like these guys are even industry professionals. They're they're up there. I want to hear their advice. Which is cool that I may be able to get it at the before party, or I may be able to get it at lunch. But like, I have no problem sitting on a panel. Well, so yes, please. It sounds like it sounds like they've recorded them and they're going to release them on the Misdirected Mark Network. But yeah, I was a little oh, okay. I was a little disappointed. Um, uh, there was a panel that I learned after the fact that would have been gr I would have really enjoyed going to, uh, but I was in the middle of a Tales from the Loop game because when I signed up for games, there were no panels. No, and I'm not gonna there. and I'm not gonna bail on a game that I've signed up for. Um, no, that wouldn't have been fair to Tom or no, anyone else if you no, did. No, absolutely. It. Uh, and it, and now there were games that had waiting lists, but that wasn't one of them. So I couldn't. It wasn't even yeah. like I could have bowed out for somebody else to. Uh, but uh, yeah, to overall worth. If you, okay, here's the the generic for the listeners out here who don't know what Mister Rettemark is, don't know what Gem is, or anything like that. This is a great local con with a extremely tight knit community that is very welcoming. This is a group of people who are going to welcome you in, arms open, sit down and have a great game with you. I cannot recommend it enough for a small con. I wouldn't suggest flying across the country to go, but if it's in driving distance, go for just Saturday, go for the weekend. Uh, if you can hit the after parties, great. If you can't, it's fine. Like the, the community is what makes this con. 
like that group of people yep. are the best people I've met. Like, you know, since the internet came around and I started interacting with people that aren't from Windsor, right? Like I, they, a lot of them are podcasters, which is how I know them originally. A lot, some of them are game designers and everything else, but they're a group, great group of people that'll welcome you into the fold. Um, there was a couple that had come just because they happened to hear about the con. By the end of the weekend, they're hugging everyone just like everyone else. They're part of the crew. They're part of the group. I don't know. I don't know what you call ourselves, but we're all part of it. Like for Sean, this was his first time meeting these people, and these are yeah. awesome people. Absolutely, awesome people that put on a good con. I'm looking forward to seeing most of them at Breakout next year because I know a lot of them. I would call them sister cons. The the two of them were very similar. I believe they uh, actually did call them sister cons yesterday on yeah. the uh, Mr. Eck Mark show. Yeah, it, it believes I, it should be. They should be. The, the yeah. cons are very similar. The, the feels the same. The vibes the same. Oh, another good point, actually. One of the most inclusive cons you will ever go to. It doesn't matter what you look like, your orientation, your pronouns. You will be welcome. There are X cards on every table. Open tables in effect. This is a safe place to play. That is important to some people. Actually, it's important to me. It's important to most people. This is a safe con, and that is fantastic. And they're even I'm talking about that. possibly doing pronouns on uh, name on uh, badges next year. Yeah, so. they had stickers this year, so yeah. I had mine on all weekend. It was it was a very welcoming con that way. Like, I, I, <laughs> I think I've said everything I can say about that. You know, and, and so, this is what, this is actually really interesting to me. This was this was my first modern con. Yeah, um, <laughs> times have changed. Times have changed. You know, it's yeah. it's funny, but you know gamers were always the geeks gamers were always the outcasts and yet at the same time looking back and thinking about it there was a real strong bro mentality oh, yeah. within the gamer community uh and it was toxic um yes there was a you know because we weren't jocks and when we got into the gaming community there was that same white male bro mentality within the gaming community that sort of played out against the external jocks uh, the, mentality the, that was out there, and the and it, man woman haters club feel right. It, the... it wasn't it wasn't healthy in, in general. No. Uh, and to walk into this con, um, and I'd heard a lot about Breakout. I was sort of you know in the periphery there for Breakout, but you know to actually walk in there and and experience you know the X's on the tables and you know the the uh, the pronoun badges and the pronoun stickers and uh, the wealth of people all participating together in a community of games mm -hmm. um, was fantastic. Uh, and, yeah. I, and, and it's, it was, it was an eye opening experience and uh, a, a wonderful one. Yeah. The only thing that matters is you're a gamer. Yep. It's the way it should be. Absolutely. From all, all ages, genders, affiliations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whoever you are, <laughs> you were that you were, you were welcome. You were a gamer. Yeah. Yes. So we went way longer than I thought we would. So we're at like two hours. We're gonna skip our. Uh, we're gonna skip everything so else on the. Uh... I don't. I'm gonna look through quick uh, announcements. We don't need anything except for those of you who don't normally listen to us. We are a brand new podcast. Like we were recording episode seven tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I realize most of you just wanted to see what we had to say about Breakout Con, but I do hope you stick around and enjoy the rest of what we have to offer. We do record currently on Thursday nights at 9.30 Eastern, same time as tonight, just tomorrow. But we are going to move that to Wednesdays. So tomorrow we are recording episode seven, which is we're going to answer Tech at the, Tech table. At the table. So that one does apply to role players. Most of our focus, yes, is more board game focused. Uh, mainly because there's a lot of RPG shows already out there, and I don't think anyone else out there is doing what we do for the board gaming community. We are going to talk about RPGs, as is pretty obvious tonight. We will bring them up again, but our focus is on board gaming, but tabletop gaming in general. The format for the show is we are a dear Abby for gamers. I want to use my gaming experience to make your game night better. I want people to send us questions, and we will answer them in three formats. We will answer them written on the blog. We'll answer them live on the Twitch show, and then we will listen. We will produce an audio podcast. And we would love it if you consume any of our media, any of the three ways, or all three. They'd all be awesome. Um, again, focus on board gaming, but also doing other tabletop. 
Tomorrow we talk tech on the table. If you're welcome to join us at 9.30 Eastern right here on Twitch. For anyone listening live, our podcast is The Tabletop Bellhop Live on your podcatcher. If you go to tabletopbellhop.com, you can find all our stuff. Um, Sean is your host. I am the Tabletop Bellhop. And one thing we do do at the end of the show. Actually, why don't we play out the whole end of the show? Sure. Because there is something I need to mention I don't know if you have it open, but right here, we need to do this. Yep. Okay. So. Speaking of our patrons, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Duran Barnett. Thank you. Brian Kurtz. Thank you. And our latest patron, Joe Swick. Thank you very much, Joe, for believing in what we're doing here. I and, interact with Joe. He's yeah. part of the misdirected Mark thing. He's and for accepting how I've here. pronounced pronounced your name at least twice on this show. <laughs> yes. Yes. And he still came back. Yep. So yes. Thanks Joe for, uh, for backing us. We greatly appreciate that. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're ready. We're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com and drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Our normal episodes of the Tabletop Bellhop Live hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday, but this is a bonus episode for our listeners and viewers. For the Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.